Hello, I'm Grace Van Myrick. I'm a senior archivist within the Cataloguing, Taxonomy and Data team at the National Archives. Today, I'll be doing a short presentation on the research and analysis work I've been conducting in relation to offensive terminology in archival descriptions. This research has looked inwards at the National Archives' current approaches and practices towards cataloguing offensive terminology, as well as across the archives and heritage sector more generally. I thought I'd start by giving some background behind this research and then talk you through findings and how these apply to our cataloguing and descriptive practices. I'll also briefly discuss our perceived next steps and future challenges and opportunities. In 2002, internal cataloguing guidance was created and published following consultation with the National Archives User Advisory Group for Social Inclusion. This guidance states that language used in the National Archives catalogue should be accurate, inclusive and guided by objectivity. Descriptive terminology reflects the advice given at the time by the consulted advisory group. When using original file titles for descriptions, staff should ensure that any offensive, pejorative or harmful terms are placed in quotation marks. This is to indicate that it is a direct quotation from the record, not an endorsement of the terminology. When not using file titles for descriptions, staff should use alternative but equally meaningful terminology. Mention might be made of offensive or harmful language by adding a note to descriptions. This guidance is located in the cataloguing area of the National Archives intranet so that staff can easily access it. The image on the slide offers a screenshot of how this appears. In spring summer 2020, I began to review this existing guidance. This was alongside an aim to produce a public facing statement which would communicate our approach to cataloguing offensive language and terminology. This was considered a timely task given that I had recently taken on my role and as the topic of offensive language in archival descriptions has been a strong focal point for the archive sector over recent years. Before moving on to discuss the research conducted as part of the review, we thought it prudent to note that several weeks into the beginning of this review, events in support of the Black Lives Matter movement occurred. Wider societal discussions were subsequently had on racism and discrimination in society. These movements and discussions were not a driver for our research work, but rather coincided with existing internal discussions being held about and ongoing work on ways to further increase inclusivity and diversity at the National Archives. These events and their aftermath clearly demonstrated that there is a societal and user demand for the research and review we are conducting. Research was conducted prior to the review of internal guidance and the drafting of a public facing statement. The research gave a solid and contemporary foundation from which to consider our descriptive practices. It also provided good examples of how other archive and heritage services were publicly stating their practices and approaches to cataloguing offensive terminology. The main research areas were approaches adopted by special collections and archive services, guidance and endorsements of archive professional bodies, academic articles from the archives and heritage sector, and protocols and projects. I'll now talk through each of these areas in a little more detail. So firstly, approaches adopted by special collections and archive services. This was selected because as already stated, language in archival descriptions is a frequently discussed topic within the archival and wider heritage sector. 
It was therefore felt that it would be a good place to research existing approaches being applied. This research included reviewing and analysing publicly facing statements on offensive language and terminology in archival descriptions. This was done alongside speaking directly with archivists at other repositories who were embarking on similar projects. Interestingly, very few repositories within the UK had public facing statements. Given this, I predominantly reviewed statements from repositories within the US, Canada and Australia. The image at the bottom left hand side of the screen is a screen grab from a public statement made by the University of Waterloo in Canada. It is worth noting that the observation of only a few UK repositories having statements on this was made at the time of the research, so summer 2020. It is therefore possible that public statements and or approaches have since been published. Secondly, I looked at guidance and endorsements from archive professional bodies. The remit of the research stretched to include archive professional bodies in the UK and beyond. This included the Archives and Records Association, the Society of American Archivists and the Association for Canadian Archivists. The image to the bottom right hand side of the screen is a screen grab of the Society of American Archivists endorsement of the Protocols for Native American Archival Materials. I'll get to protocols in a short while. This research area was selected as it offered an archive sector wide approach from which the professional bodies got their professional guidance. This was intended to serve as a compare and contrast to the research findings on approaches adopted by different repositories. Thirdly, I looked at academic articles from the archives and heritage sector. These were articles relating to language, terminology and representation in archival descriptions. By and large, these were articles published by archive professionals, but my research did extend to include articles written by those in the heritage sector. For example, the Words Matter research publication compiled by the National Museum for World Cultures. Finally, protocols and projects. This was not originally set out as a research area, but it became one as multiple academic articles pointed to these as evidence of approaches being put into practice. Much like the public facing statements on descriptive approaches towards offensive terminology, there are no clear examples of protocols within the UK. As such, this research area focused mainly on the US and Australia. It is worth noting that the scope of some of these protocols reach beyond archival descriptions with the overarching focus being on building relationships with marginalised communities. Analysis of research findings pointed to four key themes. These were consistent throughout. Sometimes they were explicitly stated and other times they were hinted at. The four key themes were to strike a balance between preserving the context of the records creation and the possibility of causing offence or upset by including terminology. It is proposed that the original terms and representations are a reflection of the time in which the records were created and that this context should be preserved. Measures should be considered alongside of this to ensure appropriate contextualisation. That there is a need for ethical, inclusive, accurate and transparent approaches to describing archival collections. There was a call for the profession not to be cleaning up history, but at the same time to be aware of its descriptive biases. It will be an iterative process that will develop over time. It will be iterative because societal views on acceptable language, terminology and representation constantly evolve. Practices and approaches must develop in line with this and meet new and emerging challenges. The process will take time, largely because of the huge scale of work often required, and because it may take a few attempts in order to get things right. A final key theme was to encourage feedback and seek community engagement. 
This ranged from engaging with the marginalised communities and groups which are represented within the records, to encouraging users to provide feedback and suggestions on descriptive approaches. As well as key themes, analysis of this research shone a light on suggested methods and approaches for managing offensive terminology in archival descriptions. There was a clear synergy between the themes mentioned in the previous slides and the suggested approaches. This felt positive as it hinted at the possibilities that could be achieved by combining theory with practice. The suggested approaches were to avoid the practice of replacing offensive language and terms with modern words and phrases. This was advised due to the proposed fluidity of language. This links to the need for approaches to be iterative and reactive to societal changes. There was a strong argument for the use of quotation marks around offensive, harmful or derogatory language. This is considered a mitigation measure as it lets the reader know that this is a direct quotation from the record and not a repository's endorsement of terminology. This approach is currently used within our catalogue and guidance. Some suggest combining the above approach with the inclusion of cautionary or editorial notes. The image to the bottom right of the screen shows an example of a special care notice as used by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Data Archive. Community engagement is also encouraged, such as user participation and harnessing public engagement to develop indexing. I'd like to draw a specific focus to one approach which was suggested in an academic article written by Alicia Chilcott. I found this particularly interesting because it proposed a good, better, best approach. This seemed akin to a sliding scale for addressing the issue of cataloguing offensive terminology. As you can see from the table on the slide, each proposed level has key targets. This offers a different benchmark for each level, depending on various factors such as available resources. Those with fewer resources could aim for good and better, whereas those with more could strive for best. The focus seems to be on simplicity and ease of application. This was considered to be a key element in ensuring successful and ongoing application of mitigation measures. The article also pointed out a lack of a unified approach towards this descriptive issue. The name of this article, should you wish to find out more, is noted on the slide, but I'll also read it here. It is Towards Protocols for Describing Racially Offensive Language in UK Public Archives. And as stated, that's written by Alicia Chilcott. The research and analysis findings were compiled to form a research paper alongside a reading list of sources which were researched as part of this review. This was circulated with senior archivists and the head of cataloguing taxonomy and data at the National Archives. Thoughts and feedback were submitted. These served as useful markers when drafting a public facing statement. I also presented research findings to groups, departments and colleagues within the National Archives. Finally, I liaised with archivists across the UK archive sector. This was done to better understand external experiences and the work being conducted in this area. I considered the outcome of these discussions against the outcome of my research and applied this accordingly. The next step was to build on my research and analysis by putting pen to paper, so to speak, and begin drafting a public facing statement. This is aimed at communicating the National Archives approach to cataloguing offensive and harmful terminology. Our stated approach is aimed to be clear and transparent. It will inform users of our approaches and the decisions behind our descriptive practices. It will demonstrate how our descriptions aim to be accurate, inclusive and respectful to all, whilst also conveying the historical content and context of our collections. In summary, our approach acknowledges the pain and the hurt that users may experience when encountering terminology within our descriptions and collections. It outlines our descriptive guidance and the methods we will use for managing offensive terminology. It publicly states our ambition to achieve fully inclusive descriptions. Finally, 
acknowledges that we may not always get things right and encourages user feedback. A frequently asked questions section will be published alongside our approach. These provide the chance for our cataloging staff to address more specific or complex questions and queries. We are hoping to be in a position to release this in the cataloging area of the National Archives website in the upcoming months. So, on to our next steps. Firstly, we will publish our statement on the National Archives website. We will support this statement by undertaking a range of future steps. These will include updating and disseminating our internal guidance for cataloging offensive terminology. This will aim to balance preservation of the historical context of records with an awareness of the hurt and the impact of language and imagery on our users. This guidance will be treated as a live document which will be continuously reviewed. When reviewing it, we will assess how the guidance measures against the evolution of language and the development of descriptive practices. This will be combined with the monitoring of the ongoing application of mitigation measures such as quotation marks around offensive language. Improved descriptions, appropriate contextualisation and the avoidance of unnecessary offensive terminology will remain part of our daily routine. Staff will also run a project which will review legacy descriptions. By this, we mean descriptions written years, decades and centuries ago. These may include language widely used at the time, but now considered offensive, harmful or pejorative. We will also review more recent descriptions for records held by the National Archives. We invite users to engage with us in this process. This can be done by using the found and error link at the bottom of the page for every description on our online catalogue, Discovery. I've added a screenshot of this to this slide. This can be used to flag any offensive or outdated language and or to suggest preferred alternative terms. These comments and suggestions will be reviewed by cataloging staff and where appropriate, descriptions will be modified or contextualized. This will be an ongoing project given its scope. We will also continue participating in internal and external discussions. In doing so, our cataloging team will be aware of all developments in this area. The research and work carried out in this area has laid the foundation for us to review and readdress our descriptive practices so as to enable our descriptions to become more inclusive and accessible. However, we know that our work in this area is far from over. Challenges still exist. I've noted two specific ones here. Firstly, keeping pace with changes in language preferences and socially accepted terminology. As mentioned earlier, language is a fluid concept. It constantly evolves. As a result, language and terms in use today may no longer be deemed appropriate. This could happen in the near and the distant future. Our cataloging staff will keep pace with these changes, remaining aware of language preferences as they evolve. We welcome feedback in this area as this can enable us to learn and adjust our practices accordingly. Secondly, wide scale application of mitigation measures. Our online catalogue discovery is ever growing with new and enhanced descriptions. This is great as it enables wider access and use of the excellent collections we hold at the National Archives. The growing number of descriptions does bring a challenge in terms of ensuring that the measures to mitigate the presence of offensive terminology are applied across all descriptions. Our project to identify and review legacy and live descriptions on Discovery will aim to address this. However, we are aware that we may not catch everything. We therefore welcome user feedback to support our work in this. Users can notify us of problematic descriptions by using the reader suggestion link on the bottom of every page of our online catalogue. A positive note to end the presentation on is that whilst there are challenges we will need to address, 
there are also great opportunities presented by work in this area. The clearest opportunity is that descriptive practice can develop so that archival descriptions are consistently inclusive and accessible to all. The development of these cataloguing practices will enable catalogers to achieve this, whilst also ensuring the preservation of the content and context of the records. The process for seizing this opportunity has been discussed throughout this presentation. Secondly, application of technologies. Work in this area provides archives and a heritage sector the chance to become more familiar with applying existing and emerging technologies in order to support cataloging processes. This could include the management of offensive terminology in archival descriptions. An example of this opportunity being tested was the Brotherton Library Special Collection in Leeds, UK. They recently tested use of a programme called AntCon to identify descriptions containing offensive language. This is part of their wider work at looking at offensive language in their descriptions. Thirdly, cross-collaboration opportunities. Archivists and heritage sector colleagues throughout the UK and abroad are exploring this topic and proposing new approaches for addressing this. This provides an excellent opportunity for the profession to cross-collaborate and to share collective experiences. The Cultural Heritage Terminology Network, led by National Library Scotland, is a great example, as in this, archive and heritage professionals can engage with the network. They can use this to discuss a range of specific terminologies relating to certain subject areas and communities. Furthermore, work and research in this area provides a chance for even wider cross-sector collaboration. This could range from record specialists to academics to outreach and engagement professionals. It will also extend to software and technology specialists. Wider discussions can forge a path towards addressing and managing offensive language and terminology in archival descriptions. It can support the overall development of descriptive practices. The opportunities and challenges discussed here are not an exhaustive list. We may encounter opportunities and challenges that are yet to be realised. We will meet these by listening, understanding and learning. In doing so, we can build towards our commitment of making the National Archives catalogue descriptions accessible and inclusive to all. Further information about the National Archives becoming the Inclusive Archive is available on our website. Thank you for your time. As this presentation has been pre-recorded for the National Archives Cataloging Week, a live Q&A session is not possible. However, I invite you to ask any questions via email. You can email me at grace.vanmarek at nationalarchives.gov.uk. Thank you.